Hi, it's me, Gemma. Um, today, we're going to be discussing how to do an enhanced assessment of the respiratory system. So already you have learned about the um, the end of bed assessment. You have learned about history taking, you've learned about red flags, you've learned about diagnosis. Uh, you've moved on to the respiratory chapter and you have reminded yourself about the anatomy. Um, we've looked at particular risk factors and red flags for the respiratory session and now we're going to be going on to look at a more enhanced assessment. So as with before we have the same aims and outcomes. So particularly for this one we'll be looking at um, exploring and reflecting on the focused assessment of the respiratory system and using a relevant framework. So let's say you're in a scenario, you're on placement and you have uh, already come across the patient, you've done their OBS, you've taken a history, you've decided there's nothing really life-threatening here, nothing really uh, flagging up to me as seriously ill. The OBS suggests that nothing's too out of the ordinary, but you want to carry out a more focused assessment. So this is where the enhanced assessment comes in. So what we're going to do is work through this in a systematic way. This is what we'll do with all our enhanced assessments. So what I'll do is while the patient is lying in the bed or sitting up, I will ask you to assess them using their hands, move up to their pulse, up to the top of the head, face, lymph nodes, chest for IPPA, and then look at the peripherals for oedema. Now, this is all linked to respiratory assessment, but you will notice that some of this actually crosses over into other assessments as well. What I want you guys to do is to remember not just what you're looking at, but what it means. So if you have, um, if, if you're checking on a patient's hands and you have one of the assessments that comes up as positive, I need you to think about what does that actually mean? What is the point of us doing this assessment unless we know the, the pathophysiology behind it? All right, so let's move on. Firstly, we're going to take a look at the hands. So what I want you to do is get the patient's hands, touch them. Yes, you're doing this OSCE on a mannequin, but we will be able to do it on each other in the skills room. So first of all, let's have a feel of the pulse. So feeling on the pulse, we're not just looking to see whether it's uh, a, a regular rhythm or if it's within normal range 60 to 100 but we're looking at the character and volume of that as well so did you know that if it's a full bouncy bonding pulse this, this could be a sign of co2 retention so if a patient has co2 retention it might mean that they're feeling a little bit acidotic or they could be dizzy with that. Um, why are they not breathing out their carbon dioxide enough? Get the entitled CO2 on, measure it. Why? Why are you feeling a little bit CO2 retention? Right, let's move on with the hands. Next thing we want to know is cholinakia. So cholinakia are inverted nail beds. Take the patient's hands, have a look at their nail beds. These are kind of spoon shaped and that will show you iron deficiencies and that leads on to anemia. So lack of iron in the blood that can make them quite fatigued. Look into it more. Does cholinakia mean anything else? Don't just take my word for it. Find yourself some references. And uh, next one in the hands is clubbing. So we have discussed this before. We get the patient to put their fingers together let me come in quite close to you like that. And right in here, there should be a little tiny gap of, uh, well, you could see through it, a space, a visual space in between them. If they're stuck together, that's clubbing. You can see there in, in this, let me get my cursor. Yep, here we go. That's what the clubbing fingernail looks like. Thank you, Teddy. Um, fingers that are clubbed, can be hereditary, they can be genetic, they can be uh, to do with ethnicity. So please don't always feel really alarmed if you see clubbed fingers. However, in this hand that's showing there, that's quite a, a familiar sign of someone with clubbed fingers. And this in general means that there's some type of respiratory issue going on here. So it could be any of the ones that is, are listed there. 
Um, but obviously, don't go to your patient and say clubbing, okay, you've got club fingernails. I think you've got lung cancer. That's not on. It's a respiratory condition. What they have, we do not know. They might already know about it. They might say, yeah, no, I've got emphysema. All right, could have told me. Okay, still on the hands, cyanosis. So cyanosis can, can be caused, uh, sorry, cyanosis can appear on any of the extremities. So you might get a blue nose, you might get blue lips. I'm going to sneeze. No, I didn't. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Um, little purple finger tips and toe tips, as you can see here. Now, this normally means poor circulation, but it can have some implications on the respiratory system as well. So there can be ongoing lung conditions that are associated with this. Or if you see a patient who does have this blue discoloration, ask them how, how long they've had it. So if they've had it for months, years, then they're pretty aware of it. They probably know what it is. Ask them what causes it. Has the doctor told you what it is? If this is something that's just come up today or in, in the last recent while, then that's really significant for us. A new sign of cyanosis is bad news. Next is nicotine staining. Not, no need to tell you about this. Obviously, if we're seeing a little yellow tinge on the fingertips, we're thinking it's highly indicative that the patient smokes and therefore quite probable that they will have some lung condition. Next one with the hands is the tremor flap. So what we do here is we ask the patient to put their hands out in front of them. Now, with, with this, you might see a slight uh, flap going on there. And that can be a sign of beta 2 agonist use. So that's, have you just taken a pump on your inhaler? But it can also be a sign of CO2 retention. So look out for that, the tremor flap. All right, so moving from the hands, we can move up the arms and onto the face. So looking at the face, we'll just pull down the eyelid quite gently, check the patient whether their eyelids are pale. If they're very pale in there, then we're thinking again, this is a sign of anemia, so an iron deficiency. Um, if they're nice and healthy, they'll be nice and pink. This is my excuse for drinking Guinness because mine are a little bit pale. So I always think, ah, Need a little bit of iron, I need a Guinness. You can use that excuse too, it's free. All right, central cyanosis. So we're looking in the mouth, ask a patient to stick their tongue out, looking all around the tongue, find out if it's nice and pink, look at the lips, are they nice and pink? Lift up the lips, look at the buccal mucosa, is that nice and pink? If it's pale, again, it can be anemia, but if it's a little bit blue, then we're thinking about circulation problems ongoing lung conditions. Now in here it says um, various respiratory illnesses such as asthma, bronchitis, PE, COPD. So think about your other risk factors for that as well. And like I said with the peripheral cyanosis, check how long your patient has had this. If it's a new thing, that is really significant. Horner's syndrome. So this is a constricted pupil. So check the pupils on both sides. Um, Pupils might be constricted and the eyelid might be quite droopy as well. So uh, this can be a sign of a tumour. Uh, it can be, but doesn't necessarily mean that. So your patient might already know that they've got Horner's syndrome or they might say, hold on, my face is drooping a little bit. Now, obviously, if you see a facial droop, you're going to be thinking neurological. You're going to be thinking about a CVA, Bell's palsy, TIA, but it might be that they've got Horner's syndrome. Yet again. Find out how long they've had this for. Is it a new presentation or ongoing? Now, there's loads of other things you can look at in the face. So, for example, when we move on to the abdominal system, you'll be looking for jaundice. What I'm doing here is giving you a little flash of the respiratory system. So don't worry if you're thinking, hold on a minute, she didn't check that. That's OK. We're just looking at respiratory conditions for now. So moving down the face, we need to check the lymph nodes. There's loads of lymph nodes. What I've put on this screen here doesn't even touch a fraction of them. There are so many of them. What I need you to know are the main ones. So we're looking under the chin here at the submental. We're looking under the jaw at the submandibular. We are looking 
down here at the tonsillars. I'm not sure if I put them in there. Yeah, and here for the tonsillars as well. We're looking here and here for the post and pre auricular around the ears. And as we go into um, some of the other systems, you might look for other lymph nodes as well. So basically, when we're thinking about the respiratory system, you're probably thinking that there might be an upper respiratory infection if you find lymph nodes um, that are inflamed. These are the kind of things that you do in yourself. You know, you think, oh, I'm not feeling too good today. Oh no, my glands are up here. Feel this, feel this. Not my glands up, aren't they? Yeah, I knew they were up. So people use this as a way of saying, yeah, I'm sick. So what are we actually looking for? We're looking for the lymphs to be hardened, inflamed, maybe even a little bit sore to touch. You can have them unilateral or bilateral. You might have a submental going on and that can still be an upper respiratory infection. What it means if you've got lymph nodes enlarged, inflamed and sore is that there's an infection somewhere. So we're thinking about the lymphatic system and how the fluid drains. It's getting caught in those lymph nodes. That's why they're big and swollen and sore. Moving on from the lymph nodes, we're going on to the chest now. So the chest, you know this from IPPA, from your nebulization. However, I want you to be more in depth about this now. So we're going to inspect, palpate, percuss and oscillate. Inspection. So standing back, looking at the patients, don't forget, expose their chest, expose the, the full thoracic cavity and again, consent, obviously think about dignity, etc. So have a look at them. How are they speaking? Is there any extra effort in what they're trying to say? Do they have to really make a conscious effort to be able to speak? What is their breathing like? Is it just normal and regular every so often? Are they taking a deep breath in? Are they little sh slow, shallow breaths? Is there a regular or an irregular pattern to the breathing? Have a look at their chest wall. Have a look, get them to turn around. You might see a different shape in the chest. Now, that was probably something that they're born with. Um, unless some people with COPD and emphysema, the heavy smokers, will have a different shaped chest as they grow older, the more that they smoke. So there are some words here. Um, look them up if you don't know them. However, there is a slide coming up which shows you a, a picture of them. Where I've written Google Jockey there is for live classes. We used to nominate somebody who would always Google um, terminology that we weren't familiar with. So anywhere that you want to just pause this, um, this video and check things up, please go ahead and do so. All right, visually inspecting, we're looking for scars. Might they have had lung surgery? Might they have had heart surgery? Any type of surgery is significant for a respiratory infection. Why do you think that is? Well, number one, infection. Number two, PE. All right, so any masses, little lumps that are unexplained, lesions, bruising, scars, uh, trauma. We're looking at the chest expansion. So we've done this before in our NEBS. We're looking at when you lay your hands on the patient, and you'll see a video of this, or is both sides of the chest expanding equally? As we know with respiration, diaphragm flattens, rib cage moves out. Chest wall, we're looking at chest wall thickness. We're also looking at the shape of the chest. So these blue bloaters, pink puffers, barrel chest, we'll have some pictures of them as well, but that's basically when the lungs get expanded. So those people with emphysema, they might not breathe out their CO2 as much. Over time, all their has made their lungs expand. And they do have this kind of a chest where it, it's quite, quite big and broad. And then it goes really far in uh, around about their abdominal area. You might see it in their face as well. Those people with emphysema, pursed lips breathing. That's also something to check out in inspection. This list is not exhaustive. Here we go. Here's a picture of um, some of the words that we were looking up from the last slide. As you can see, um, some of these 
um, in some of these look obvious. So with scoliosis, you can see there that that's a spinal issue. But when you look at the, the pectus excavatum and the pectus carinatum, well, I didn't say that right, carinatum, um, that's actually chest wall abnormalities. So anything you don't know about there, write it down, look it up. All right, palpation. So in the previous neb ospi, you did your chest expansion. You went around the back of the patient, laid your hands on them, the back of your hands, literally here, and felt for the rise and fall to make sure there was equal rise and fall. We're also going to be feeling for masses. So you're feeling around the chest area. Is there any masses under the skin there? Little lumps that the patient might not know about. They might know about. Crepitus, that kind of creaking noise that the pleura make. We're looking for subcontinuous emphysema. That's the bubble wrap. You can feel that. You can hear that right underneath the skin. And that's little pockets of fluid that are underneath there. That can be a sign of attention pneumothorax, did you know? But it can be a sign of many other things. So again, just keep going. Keep looking these things up. Now, frematis. This is controversial. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. What you're actually doing here is you are putting the bony part of your hand in the intercostal spaces on the patient. And you're checking for vibrations as they speak. So I have written here a little bit of an explanation for it. So noise passed through the bronchi and lungs. So it's basically water and noise. So there is quite a lot of physics in this. But basically, you're feeling for the tremble, the noise waves coming through. If there's excess fluid there, you will feel that in the bone of your hand. I've got a video to show you on that. It's outside of this presentation, but this will show you how to actually carry out the uh, tactile vocal fremitus. You've got your patient. You will get them to say a phrase. So sometimes in some of the videos, they have them saying 99 which is why the delicious uh, 99 ice cream is there. Some people say blue balloon. So I thought it was nice to have a picture of an ice cream than a blue balloon. But you're trying to get them to say things that will make uh, the frematis more exaggerated. Like I say, we will look at a video on this. Here is the positions where you are going. Um, you're basically, you're having to go in the apices, the superior lobes, middle lobe, and inferior lobes. What you're looking for here is whether there are regular noises, whether there's increased noises or decreased noises, and also is it on both sides or is it unilateral? Percussion. So again, I'm going to guide you to a video on percussion. It's vital that you know how to do this. It's really quite difficult on certain sur um, surfaces. However, on the naked skin, it shouldn't be that difficult for you to hear that. So we're checking side by side. We're checking for hypo resonance, hyper resonance, or normal resonance. Now, here on, on my slide, I've written what are they and discuss examples. So I want you to pause this, pause this video, and write down what you think hypo resonance might signify and hyper resonance might signify. So there's only like a couple of answers for each. It shouldn't take you very long. Hypo resonance is that low sound. And hyper resonance is an echoey sound. So with hyper resonance, that's air trapped inside. What would cause that? Hypo resonance, it's some type of fluid trapped inside. What would cause that? So like I say, I'm going to pop up the video that has got Rob and I showing you how to perfect this technique. Auscultation, we're already doing this, but now we need you to know more than just there's a wheeze. I want you to know where you can hear normal breath sounds. I want you to be able to tell me whether it's inspirational, expirational. I want you to know what sounds normal and what doesn't. And if it doesn't sound normal, what does it sound like? So I need you to um, listen to these noises. 
so that you can uh, explain and hear for yourself. So there will be examples of noises to listen to. That will be part of your uh, homework or pre-learning, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and hopefully you're going to get used to recognising those because once you go on placement, I want you with the stethoscope, listen to as many patients as you possibly can. Don't forget, right lung has three lobes. That's why we always go into the axilla. Oh, sorry, I forgot to move this one up. Um, I am blocking this. I do apologise for that. I thought I fixed all of that. Um, so basically, where are you going to listen to and where will you hear the normal noises? So that will come in your oscillation lesson as well, which is attached to this. I'll just leave you a second to read that. Going to move on because I feel weird. Okay, after oscillation, oops, sorry. Um, sorry, this was signposting. So the visible body atlas, you can find that in the database. You know where you find EBSCOhost? You can find visible body atlas. Just look under V and you will be able to actually listen to these noises there. Obviously, you can get it on YouTube as well. Um, but it's a good idea if you know at least these four. There are so many other ones, but these are the minimum. And lastly, after we finish our oscillation, our IPPA, we are moving into oedema to try and find out if the patient has got any. So where you'll find this, legs, arms, feet, ankles, cankles, uh, but also the back. So anywhere where fluid can gather. And this is especially important for those patients who are not mobile. So they might be bed bound. You'll probably find a lot of oedema in the lower extremities. Gravity, don't forget, bringing the fluid down. So the pitting oedema there, so that is a patient's foot. Let's just pretend it's my hand like for, for now. What you do is you press into it, hold it there for a couple of seconds. When you let go with mine, it's going back to normal. With pitting oedema, that will stay indented. Why is that? That's because there's lots of fluid in there. What can fluid, uh, what, what are the ill effects of fluid? What can that cause? If you've got fluid in your arms and legs, likelihood is you're going to have it in your lungs as well. So fluid in the lungs, you can have that in terms of infection, where it goes within days or weeks. But those people who've got heart failure will have this chronically. They will get really out of breath when they're doing anything, any form of exertion. This is really important for us to recognize, especially if the patient doesn't know they've got it. So fluid on the lungs, you might say to the patient, uh, do you sleep lying down or sitting up? And you'll find these patients with heart failure do sleep sitting up. You can ask them, how many pillows do you use when you sleep? And you've probably seen it on placements. You know, these people that have got like 20 pillows. The reason why is because once they lay flat, the all of the fluid goes into the lungs. They feel like they're drowning. If you ever have a patient with this in the ambulance, don't make them lie down. Don't make them lie down. It will really panic them. So nice sitting up, get the fluid to the bottom of the lungs. You'll probably be able to oscillate that. You might hear a little bit of crackles. Now we'll cover oedema a little bit more in the cardiovascular system because it lends itself to heart failure and it affects the right ventricle as well. Now, one of your uh, tasks that you'll be set this week is to look at signs and symptoms of various conditions. So pulmonary oedema, you'll find a certain type of spit with this, sorry, a certain type of sputum, a certain type of oscillation. But it's very important that you have a look at patients uh, arms, hands, legs, feet, and you do the little pokey poke to see if there is pitting oedema, whether it stays in there. And that's it for the enhanced respiratory assessment. Um, I will put this video to you um, in another link. This is Geeky Medics. Some of you will have heard me um, talking about them, or I quite often retweet them. They are really, 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 really helpful for our OSCEs. They're basically junior doctors and they will go through the OSCE bit by bit like you need to.
Now, it won't always match up 100% with ours, but what we're doing is an overview of the respiratory system. You will be repeating this in simulation. So what we'll be doing in the next couple of weeks in simulation is taking a full patient history of a respiratory condition, doing an enhanced assessment, and then trying to figure out what might be wrong with the patient. So for now, that's it for the respiratory enhanced assessment. And if you've got any questions, please write them on the Moodle shell. Thank you. Uh, stop sharing. There we go.